Welcome to John Gates Games. This is my variety vlog for June 2018, and as you can see, I'll be covering a bunch of different things in this video, so feel free to skip ahead to the part that most interests you, or stick around for the whole thing. As always, let's go ahead and begin with a general update and a super brief Patreon update. Over the last four weeks, there were 12 new uh, backers to the Patreon campaign, which is a pretty large amount, definitely more than I've seen in a four-week span for quite a while, uh, but unfortunately, the overall support level dropped by $3 over the course of the last month, and I think this leads me directly into the only real uh, uh, update that I have to talk about for the channel, and that is a follow-up to last month's announcement that I'm not making review videos anymore. I think that uh, looking at what happened on the Patreon uh, tells me a story of everything that happened in that uh, a bunch of people, I think, were very supportive of me uh, switching over to focusing on playthroughs, and I think that actually pulled a bunch of new support in, people who decided to pledge support to the campaign because they want to see that, but there were also many people who backed out of the campaign and many people who reduced their um, support amount by decent amounts and I think that's why it kind of leveled out to essentially be a flat line experience. And I think that when I look at the overall uh, feedback that I've had from that announcement, I am very pleased. <laughs> there were tons of people who commented on the last vlog, um, and 99.9% .9 of the people were just very supportive of me making this change, even though many of them said uh, that they wished I would continue making reviews, but most people had that caveat of, but it's good that you're making this change if it is what's best for you. And um, at the moment, I still believe that this is the uh, best thing for me. Honestly, I've been so excited to be playing games over this last month and not having to worry about reviewing them is just a very different headspace to be in. There's been a couple of games that I've played where I've already started like pick things apart and like, oh, analyze that. Maybe I should try to abuse that in the next game to see if it's a problem. And then I've told myself, wait, no, no, stop. I don't need to try and break this game. I just need to enjoy this game. Like, just try and have fun, try to win, and I can talk about that experience without having to, like, you know, rip the, the hood off of the car and try to see if anything's leaking underneath. Now, obviously, sometimes those things come out when you're just playing a game normally, but it's been a nice headspace uh, place to be of uh, just trying to focus on having fun and uh, less so on trying to actually find all of the flaws that might be in any one particular game. So, yeah, I'm just very happy with the amount of support that people have given me. Um, I'm very excited that people are excited about me doing this uh, in the future, and it's just, it's fun getting these new games in and thinking, okay, well, I'm going to make a playthrough for this one, and I hope to make a playthrough for that one, and I'm looking forward to playing the game on camera, just like I'm looking forward to playing the game with people. So overall, I'm very happy with um, the last four weeks of this kind of uh, new scheduling plan, and going forward, I hope I continue to be so. So uh, speaking of which, let's move into the next segment. Uh, this is the uh, upcoming videos section. Um, I have uh, a, a decent idea of what the next four weeks are going to look like. Um, for the next week, week 30, I'm going to be doing a sponsored full playthrough of the fully cooperative game, The Reckoners. Uh, and then the week after that, I'm going to be doing a playthrough for Lowlands. That one was uh, voted on by the Patreon supporters on the Patreon campaign. And they're the ones who, they really wanted to see that. It won by no contest to the next uh, game up there. Uh, I'll also be doing an initial impressions vlog in week 31, along with Lowlands. And then the week after that, well, I have two games slotted in there right now. It's uh, The Lost Expedition from Osprey and Luxor, which I was planning on doing uh, in this previous month, but things just kind of had to get shuffled around a little bit, and Luxor didn't end up getting made. And at this point, I am hoping to get one or two videos um, out in that week. It will possibly be uh, the Lost Expansion, uh, Lost Expedition, and Luxor, but it's also possible I might sub something else in there if I'm feeling like it uh, in the moment. And then obviously the week after that will be week 33, and that's what I'm going to do, another variety vlog. Um, that week will probably be just this one, just the one video, because I'm going to be working like crazy at my other job for that week, so it's going to be a little bit um, interesting trying to work that in amongst um, the making videos that I've been doing. Um, for instance, last week when I put out the Vikings Gone Wild full playthrough, I also worked a eight to nine hour day um, pretty much every day of the week, seven days straight. And I was like recording for a few hours every single night for five nights in a row to go ahead and get that one done. And uh, yeah, it's a bit of a challenge, but either way, that's what the schedule looking forward for the next four weeks looks like. All right, let's now move into the questions and answers section. If you have any questions you'd like me to answer in a future vlog, then please send those over to johngetsgames at gmail.com. And let's now go ahead and move in. And I only have one question to talk about this week, but it is a large multi-parter. Now, this one came in from Trevor Olson, and he uh, said that he'd love to hear my general thoughts on Board Game Geek and how it fits into our hobby. Uh, then they'd like to know how and when did I discover the website? Uh, what features do I use most often? Are there any cool tricks or hidden gems that I've found over the years? And finally, uh, 
Um, if I could change one thing about the website, what would it be? Now, okay, this is a lot of different uh, questions, so let's go ahead and start from the top. Uh, my general thoughts on BoardGameGeek are that it is an amazing website uh, to have that much of a repository of knowledge and uh, information and videos and uh, photos and just thoughts and everything about board games is on this one place. And I feel like we are, um, as board gamers, incredibly fortunate to have this sort of situation. Uh, I have, I know people who are part of different other hobbies, and I don't really know of any other one that has just one centralized place where you can go to and all the things that you care about are right there. You know, Board Game Geek is always the first website that I look at when I'm bored. Look, you know, I pull up my phone, I pull up an internet browser, I always go to BGG first, and I check the subscription feed um, to see if there are any um, new posts on games that I'm interested in, or updates to uh, threads that I've been looking at already, uh, or in particular because I have a YouTube page, I always scroll down to see if there are any new comments on any of the videos that I posted. And I've obviously posted um, hundreds of videos to Board Game Geek now, so uh, every week I get several comments on some of the new ones, and sometimes uh, surprisingly uh, old videos get a comment, and I'm like, oh wow, I haven't thought about that game or that video in a long time. And I guess this kind of uh, leads me into uh, your next question, or I guess no, the middle question, um, where they said, uh, what features do you use most often? That's absolutely going to be the subscription feature. Uh, if you uh, know about Board Game Geek and you don't click that little subscribe button or you've never tried to, then you're just missing out on the whole reason, in my opinion, that that website exists. Because if you are interested in a game and you click subscribe, then it will just show you all of the new content for that specific game that comes out, whether it be images or videos or new posts or um, blog posts or there's so many different things that can be tied in with a game and you can find all of those in one consolidated place with the subscription page. Now, um, I've kind of skipped ahead, so let's go back a little bit uh, to uh, the previous question where they said, um, how slash when did I discover Board Game Geek? Well, I'm pretty sure that was probably around 2009. Uh, I had been uh, playing uh, Settlers of Catan. Actually, no, it would have been 2008. I'd been playing Settlers of Catan with a, the same group of people for months and months. We just only played this game. We weren't really board gamers. We were just Settlers of Catan players. And after months of playing this game, you know, tens of times, it occurred to me that I wanted to kind of look it up to see if maybe I'd buy my own copy because I was playing with a friend's copy. And when I searched for it, I think Board Game Geek was the first thing that popped up. So I clicked on that and I looked looked at the website and and that's how I found out um, by looking through there that there were expansions. I didn't know there were expansions that, at that time. And I actually went out and bought the Cities and Night ex uh, Nights expansion and gave it to my friend who had the base game so that we could all play it together because I was so interested in playing with that expansion. And then we played Cities and Nights just tens of times after that. Um, now, my initial impression of the website, I think, was um, much like everybody else's, where it's just a wall of text. It's just there's so much stuff. It's a very busy website. And it took me a long time, I think, to get comfortable with parsing through it. Um, I don't think I actually made an account for um, a couple of years uh, after I uh, found out about Board Game Geek at first. I was not going there every day. Obviously, that came later as I became uh, much more fluent at using the website and uh, much more obsessed with following board games all the time. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how I fell into it. And it's been almost 10 years now of using the website. Um, so the next question was any cool tricks or hidden gems that I found over the years? Well, I thought about this one for a little bit, and I do have uh, one little trick that uh, that I use that I'm not sure if other people do, and that involves um, how you um, you store your collection on Board Game Geek. And I haven't even talked about this yet, uh, but it is great that you can um, mark that you own games on Board Game Geek, so you can just look over there and see all of the games you have in your collection, which is just a really uh, convenient way to see what you have and maybe rate all those different games and whatnot. But there's one thing that I wanted to do, and that was to sort the games by um, chronological order from when I bought them. And when I first looked into this and you see the little collection page, it doesn't really seem like there is an option for that. But what I found is that if you go into the advanced, um, uh, not settings, but options for a game when you add it to your collection, there is an option that says acquisition date. And you just plug that in. And then if you go back to your main collection, you will find that it's not there. So what you have to do is click a little button that says, I think, columns, and then you have to activate the um, acquisition date uh, column field, and then that pops up pops up onto the page, and then you can click on it to actually sort your entire collection by the date in which you got it. Now, this only works if you actually plug in those dates, but I've been doing this for probably about three years now, and every time I get a new game, I uh, log that I own it, I click the little button, and then I go to advanced settings, and I put the acquisition date in there because 
to me, I just like seeing when I got new games. So that's, uh, I don't know if it's really a hidden uh, trick, so to speak, but it's something that um, that uh, makes the collection process a little more satisfying for me, although most people are probably not as interested in knowing when they got their games as maybe I am. Okay, so let's move on to the next, I guess the last thing, and they said, um, if there is one or two things that I could change about the website, what would it be? Well, I thought about this one for a little bit as well, and I realistically want to talk about just one thing, and that involves modification to the subscription feed. Now, I've talked about that one already. I think it's the most powerful, best part of Board Game Geek, but unfortunately, I haven't figured out a way to unsubscribe from specific things within a board game. You know, if I subscribe, uh, click that subscribe button to a new game, I will get an update for every new image, for every new post on every single one of the forums, whether that be rules, or general or strategy, or there's just many different uh, forum types. And in particular, I would love to be able to unsubscribe to the rules forum as default for every single game, because um, it seems like that's not really what I want to see pop up on my subscription feed. If I have a rules question, I want to go to the game and then go to the rules forum and search for it and find the answer there. But when I'm going to my subscription feed, I want to see news, I want to see discussions, I want to see strategy, I want to see all that stuff. And it just oftentimes gets clogged up with rules questions, especially if I'm um, subscribed to a game that is maybe very compl complex. Like I remember when, back when I used to be subscribed to Gloomhaven, it just seemed like I couldn't see anything else because there were just so many uh, rules questions that popped up for that game when it first uh, hit market. And I actually just unsubscribed myself from the Gloomhaven uh, game because even though I'm interested in some of the content that's there, it kind of gets squelched out by uh, so many rules questions. So anyway, it's a tiny minor thing that would definitely make uh, my life better uh, if it was modified on the website, but I think they have a very long laundry list of uh, subtle modifications to large modifications they want to do to Board Game Geek to make it better. But anyway, I think I've talked about this one uh, definitely long enough. Uh, obviously, Board Game Geek is an amazing resource uh, for me as a content creator. Um, just having a spot where so many people can go to that location to see content about those games. Like they could click subscribe on a game and then I make a video for that game. Then my video pops up onto their subscription feed and then they watch it. And so much, uh, so much of the, uh, um, the views that come to uh, my uh, YouTube channel come from Board Game Geek. I'm, I haven't actually looked at the specifics of it right now, but I think it's something on the order of 20 to 30% of the views that I get come through Board Game Geek. So um, it's an essential part of being a media creator in the board game space. And uh, yeah, okay, I've definitely talked about this one long enough. All right, so if you have any uh, questions you'd like me to answer in a future vlog, then feel free to send those over to johngetsgames at gmail.com. And let's now go ahead and move on. So the next segment is going to be the shifting shelf. This is where I talk about all of the new games that I acquired over the last four weeks and all of the games I had to pull off my shelf to make room. Now, if you look at this list, you'll notice there are a lot more new games to games that I pulled off the shelf. That's because I think I'm cheating a little bit. I don't think all of those new games will fit on the shelf. So when I actually try to shove them in there, I will likely have to pull some more off, but I decided not to do that just now. So I'll probably have to pull uh, even more games out of the collection in the next vlog. But for now, let's go ahead and talk about these. It looks like uh, I was able to pick up a copy of Metro X as well as Past Tally. These were both um, in the Board Game Geek store. They're originally um, published in Japan and Board Game Geek was able to bring a few of them over. Uh, Past Tally sold out very quickly, I think in like 10 or 15 minutes. So I was very happy and felt very lucky to be one of the people who was able to swoop in and pick that up because it is a uh, tile lane game of, as you're making crazy little pathy uh, um, connections on this little board. I'll be talking about it in my initial impressions vlog coming up soon because I have been able to play that one. And uh, Metro X is a roll and write game by Hisashi Hayashi. I don't really know much more about that, but I'm looking forward to trying that one. Uh, I also picked up a copy or received my Kickstarter backing copy of Oaxaca. I don't back that many games on Kickstarter these days, but this is uh, one of the few ones that uh, intrigued me enough. It has great art and you're rolling dice and you're doing a bit of engine building and it supposedly plays in only like 30 minutes or so. I haven't played it yet, but um, I'm intrigued to try that one out. Uh, I also picked up three games from Osprey Games. Uh, they sent uh, media copies over to me of The Lost Expedition, London 2nd Edition, and High Society. As I mentioned before, I'm uh, hoping to try and get a playthrough done of The Lost Expedition. I can't really commit to that at this point. At this moment, I might change my mind, but um, that one is a fully cooperative game of trying to make it um, through an expedition to a lost temple. And it looks like it has some really neat ideas in the uh, cooperative vein where you're doing things together, but you're not allowed to communicate that much about what you have in your hand. Uh, London 2nd Edition is, I believe, a hand management uh, engine building game, and uh, High Society I've talked about already, and it's just a wonderful reprint of a decades-old game by Ryan 
Heinrich Nietzsche um, about trying to uh, spend your money as best as you can without losing all of it. Um, I also picked up two games as uh, media copies from Z-Man Games, and that is Lowlands and Race to the Newfoundland. Now, I've played both of those already, and I talked about Lowlands in the last Impressions vlog, and I will talk about Race to the Newfoundland in the future Impressions vlog because I have been able to play that one already as well. Um, I've enjoyed both of those, uh, in particular Lowlands, but I've talked about that one definitely enough in these vlogs. Uh, and lastly, we've got Thunderstone Quest. This was sent as a media copy to me from AEG, and it's just a massive box. It's like this big, by this big, by that big, and it weighs about 15 pounds, and it's just chock full of cardboards, uh, cards and cardboard, uh, and it's um, yet another version of Thunderstone. Like This is, I think, the third um, version of Thunderstone that's come out, and this is just a big deck-building game of dun uh, delving into dungeons and trying to slay monsters, and I don't really know much about Thunderstone Quest. I haven't had a chance to really crack that massive box open yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing what they've done. Uh, we can now move on to the leaving side, the games that I had to remove. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm cheating a little bit. I probably should have removed a few more than this, uh, but I pulled Soul, uh, The Last Days of a Star, I believe it's called. Uh, that one is a like two to five player abstract game of trying to um, create little uh, tokens around a star as you're trying to harvest energy from a star before the star explodes and you're trying to leave the solar system. Uh, I played it once at two players it didn't really impress me that much. I feel like I had to play it with three or more players and I just honestly never got back around to it. And I just don't see myself making an effort to play it again. So it doesn't make sense to have it around. I'm also getting rid of Palace of Mad King Ludwig. Um, I really wanted to like this game, but ultimately it just, every time it hit the table, it left several people around the table um, feeling not very satisfied with the overall experience. It just seemed like a very fiddly experience. And I don't know, it just wasn't making people happy. And I thought it was okay, but definitely um, uh, uh, take it or leave it kind of situation. So I've now decided to leave it. And the other one is Fate of the Elder Gods. I did a uh, playthrough for this one a few months ago. And um, it's just not really the kind of game that gets played that much within our play group. I mostly had the copy in order to cover it on the channel uh, for Greater Than Games. So I think it's um, got some pretty cool ideas in there, but it's not necessarily something that is seeing play for us. So I figure that one should probably move on. Okay, well, speaking of moving on, we should now go to the last segment. This is the uh, Games of Interest segment, um, but also I think it could be called just the John's New Subscriptions. I'm not really sure uh, what I'm going to uh, end on for the name of this segment, but I'm definitely going to be grabbing my laptop uh, because there are 20 different games that I want to talk about now. And the way this works is um, these are all the new games that I've clicked the subscribe button on on Board Game Geek over the last four weeks. And I'm going to very briefly run through all of these and just give you a... a an idea of why I click the subscribe button for each of these. And so, yeah, without further ado, I think we should jump into it. Uh, the first one of these is Azul Stained Glass of Sintra. Now, this is essentially a second um, version of Azul. It looks like it has a lot of Azul's um, uh, mechanics in it where you are trying to um, pull tiles off of little factories. It looks like it has a lot of similarities, but they haven't released the rules yet. And it does look like it has some significant differences as well, because this time you're now building stained glass windows. And it looks like you have modular boards for how you actually build those things out. And hopefully, it, I think they have um, uh, different end game conditions and uh, things that you're going for. Uh, I liked Azul, but I felt like Azul really needed some uh, help in the variability perspective, and hopefully this is going to help that, although it's a very confusing name, Azul, colon, Stained Glass of Sintra, I think it's going to be hard to separate those two out. But either way, I'm looking forward to finding more about that one. Uh, the next up, we have a game called Catalyst. This one's coming out by DV Giotti, and it's designed by a whole bu a bunch of people. <laughs> I don't know a ton about this game. Uh, the main mechanisms are listed as uh, card drafting and set collection. Um, the main gist of it is that it looks like you are um, taking cards to put down into a tableau in front of yourself to try and build up combos. And I think you put them down and put them down and put them down, and then you suddenly evaluate and do a whole bunch of chainy combo -y stuff. And I like chainy combo -y stuff. I like setting things up and then, you know, lighting the match and seeing what happens. And so hopefully that's what this game is kind of like. I don't know much more about it than that, but I'm keeping my eye out on Catalyst. Uh, next up, we have Dominations, Road to Civilization. And I think the idea of this one is it's like dominoes and nations kind of squished together. So dominations, uh, because what you're doing in this game is you're placing down these little uh, triangular uh, tiles and they kind of match up sort of like dominoes with various colors. 
The colors, I think, give you resources and you can spend the resources to get technology. It's kind of themed in a civilization style and I don't know how good it's actually going to be, but uh, just looking at the images on BoardGameGeek has me quite intrigued to at least uh, learn a little bit more about this one because I enjoy a tiling game and it looks like this one has a communal tiling thing that you're doing in the middle and then you're also making your own personal tiling thing of technology. So yeah, I don't know much more about it than that, but I'm curious to find out more. Uh, we can now move on to Expand City. Uh, this one is being designed, uh, it was designed by Alex Cutler and Matt Fantastic. Well, neither of their names are particularly familiar to me. It's being published by Breaking Games. And the reason this one stuck out to me is because it looks like it's a communal uh, tile laying game where you are building out a city with these little square tiles. But then on top of the tiles, you're putting these three-dimensional tokens, um, uh, plastic uh, building pieces that stack on top of each other. And so it has a very uh, good feel to it. Like you look at the images, you can see it's very three-dimensional. And I don't think you're actually competing with those towers. I think as soon as you go to one, you just stick to it and you get points for how tall your tower is or something like that. Like that. Either way, it's listed as 45 to 60 minutes, and uh, I just like to know a little bit more about it. I mostly click sub subscribe because um, it looks really nice in the images. Uh, let's go ahead and move on now to Extraordinary Voyages colon Pirates. Now, this game is set to come out in 2019. It's designed by Don Beyer and Glenn Drover. Uh, publisher is Forbidden Games. There's not a whole lot of information on Board Game Geek about this one right now. It says it has deck slash pool building uh, mechanisms in it. Uh, I'm, I'm very tentative about this one. I almost didn't click subscribe, but uh, when I read through it, it talked about, um, let's see here, uh, you are in the Caribbean and you are, looks like you're trying to do pillaging, but you're also trying to find the uh, Spanish treasure galleon of Trinidad. And um, as you are playing through, the better your deck is, the faster your ship moves. So you're trying to plunder things, but also to make your deck better, I think, but then also try to race to get to the very end. I don't know, thematically, that one might be fun or it might not actually bring anything particularly new to the uh, um, to the deck building genre, but I'm looking forward to seeing what maybe pops up on this one. Uh, next up, we have Festo with an exclamation point. Uh, this one is designed by Arv... D. Fueler, and uh, the reason that might sound familiar to you uh, is because he has designed a couple other games. I'm going to look it up right now so that I don't look like an idiot, but I know that, yeah, he did El Gaucho as well as Pagoda and a bunch of more uh, that I've not, I'm not familiar with, uh, Ski Bay and T Take Take. Either way, uh, he's designed quite a few games, and I really liked El Gaucho. Um, I ultimately had a couple problems with it, but either way, that designer uh, is enough for me to be interested in it. Also, it's being published by Game Brewer, and they have definitely put out some interesting games in the past, and uh, they're putting out um, Gugong uh, in a few months, which I've played and I really liked, so I'm intrigued by the stuff that they put out, and I don't really know much about the game. The mechanisms say area movement, programming, area control, press your luck, worker placement, uh, it looks like it's got a kind of a light theme of elves, dwarves, pixies. Um, you're trying to, uh, you roll some dice and then you, oh, that's right. That's right. I, I remember reading this before. You roll the dice and they tell you uh, which things are going to be available within each given round. And I think those different things like elves and wizards and whatnot have different abilities that you're using to try and you know, win the game. I don't know much more than that, but either way, it looks cute, even though there are no uh, images, just the text of it sounds kind of cute. So I'm curious in seeing about, more about that one. Let's go ahead and move on now to another game uh, being published by Game Brewer. This one's called Fuji Koro. It's listed as a 2019 release, and it has a bunch of mechanisms, including dice rolling, modular board, push your luck, tile placement, uh, action point allowance. Uh, but when you read through the description of this game, because there are currently no images on Board Game Geek, it looks like the theming is you have it's uh, 1707. Mount Fuji is about to erupt, and there is a temple on Mount Fuji that you are rushing into, uh, and you are you are shogun, and you're or no, the shogun is uh, telling you to run into the temple to go ahead and try to uh, ask, uh, scavenge as much stuff as you can before the temple falls apart. And it looks like there's a lava rising mechanism and there's push your luck as you're running around. It's uh, competitive as you're trying to grab as much stuff as you can. Just again, thematically, that sounds pretty cool. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing some images and some more information on that one, but there isn't much else on Board Game Geek right now. Uh, we can now move on to Gizmos. This one's coming out in 2018. Uh, it's being published by Simon and it's designed by Phil Walker Harding. 
Now, he has designed a whole bunch of games, uh, some of which I haven't liked that much, and some of which I liked a lot. Uh, for instance, uh, Archaeology, I really didn't like. That one did not work out. Uh, but Baron Park was excellent, and I still have that in my collection, uh, and I look forward to playing that one more in the future. I think it's just a brilliant tiling game. So um, that is enough for me to be interested in seeing what Phil Walker Harding does in the future. Oh, also he did, um, uh, oh my goodness, uh, Imhotep, that's right, <laughs> Imhotep, uh, which I'll be talking a little bit more uh, later about. But either way, in Gizmos, um, it definitely has a uh, something that catches your eyes. You're walking by the table. It has this big bucket, and inside that bucket is um, little marbles, and coming out the bottom is a single string of marbles in a row. And what you're doing in this game is engine building, I think, as you're building cards down in front of yourself that use these marbles in a variety of ways to end up squeezing out victory points. And I'm not really sure how the marble thing works, but when you pull one marble out, the rest slides in and it feels like it might be kind of a gimmick but it also seems like it's intriguing and I definitely would love to try it. Uh, I think this one is actually coming out very soon so uh, it's possible this one will be available for people to try uh, somewhat soon but either way uh, Gizmos um, popped up on my radar relatively recently. Uh, well, here we go. We can now move on to Imhotep Das Duel. Uh, this is what I was just talking about before because this is also designed by Phil Walker Harding uh, and it's being published by Cosmos. And um, Das Duel means, I believe, the duel in German. And so this is essentially two player only Imhotep. And I liked Imhotep when it came out a couple years ago. It has an interesting thing going on where you are loading these uh, boats with different workers, um, but then the boat gets uh, pushed onto a certain spot by one of the players. It might be you, it might be somebody else. And so you're pushing your luck as to how many workers you put into a boat before somebody maybe shoves those workers into a spot that you don't want them to actually work. Um, this worked out really well, actually. I thought it was a pretty cool mechanic. It definitely led to some contentious moments. And I'm curious to see what uh, the two-player version of it has uh, in store. So that one's listed as 2018 as well. So uh, yeah, I'd definitely like to try that one. Uh, let's go ahead and now move on to Mutants, uh, Genetic Gladiators. This one is listed as a 2019 release by Lucky Duck Games. Uh, now, they're actually going to be running a, um, a Kickstarter for this one in September. And I know that because I'm planning on making a sponsored uh, full playthrough for this one uh, coming out in September. This is why I clicked subscribe on this one. That's how I found out about it. Uh, it looks like this one is a deck building game with hand management and variable player powers. Uh, you are trying to breed new mutants, uh, incubate uh, your cards to make them better in the next rounds and you deploy them. It seems like it might be kind of similar to Vikings Gone Wild that came out by Lucky Duck, um, or it might be quite different. Uh, either way, it seems like it's probably going to be an interactive deck building type of experience. And I'm looking forward to getting the prototype copy of that one to seeing what that one's about. Uh, that one, oh, that one's also being uh, designed by Senfu Lim and Jesse Wright. Um, I don't think either of those people sound particularly familiar to me. But either way, let's go ahead and move on uh, to New Frontiers. Uh, this one is being designed by Thomas Lehman, who is um, famous for designing Race for the Galaxy, as well as um, uh, several other things like Roll for the Galaxy and uh, uh, one of the Roll for the uh, Ages, I think. He did the Iron Age. Either way, uh, this one is a new game in the Race for the Galaxy um, genre, I guess. But what's going on here is it's, I think, less of a card game, and it goes back more to its Puerto Rico roots. Because um, Puerto Rico was the, um, the impetus for lots of new games that came out. Uh, for instance, um, you have San Juan, which is kind of like Puerto Rico the card game. You have Race for the Galaxy, which is kind of like Puerto Rico the card game. And you have Glory to Rome, which is also like Puerto Rico the card game. So it looks like New Frontiers is kind of going a little bit full circle. Um, it has the Race for the Galaxy uh, theme going on, but it uses more the Puerto Rico style action selection where you choose one action and then you get to do it better, but then everybody else gets to follow you. And when you look at the images that they posted online, I'm not really seeing many on Board Game Geek, but I know I've seen them on Twitter. Um, it looks like it's actually a bit chunkier, like you have cardboard tokens that you put down onto a board. So it's not really a card game. It's definitely a board game. And I'm looking forward to see what's going on there because um, I've enjoyed Race uh, for the Galaxy and Roll for the Galaxy in the past. Uh, definitely some cool combo-y engine ability stuff that you could do in those games. And um, I also liked Puerto Rico. So hopefully New Frontiers brings some pretty cool stuff into the genre. Okay, let's now move on to Orbis. This one is being published by, oh, Space Cowboys. Uh, it's set for 2018, and uh, the de designer is Tim Armstrong, the second. Uh, looks like he has designed Kaiju Crush 
and bad maps. I haven't heard of either of those before, but either way, the reason that Orbis stuck out to me and the reason I clicked subscribe is because it's got these uh, vibrant tiles in the middle of the table and it is a tile lane game, which I do enjoy making. And it looks like the theming of this one is you are kind of building up worlds and then you're gonna, at the end of the game, score to see who has the better world. Um, the mechanisms are network building and tile placement. Um, it looks like uh, every single turn you pick from a certain subset of the region tiles and then you can add them into your area or use gods. It's only 15 rounds. I don't know much more about it, but either way, uh, it says that uh, you want to become the best god and craft your most prosperous universe. And uh, yeah, it, just, it looks fun. It just looks vibrant and bright. And I've liked things that Space Cowboys has made in the past. So I'm looking forward to seeing what's going on with that one. Okay, now we have Porto. This one is published by Mebo Games, which is not uh, familiar to me. Uh, this one is listed as a hand management tile placement game. Uh, it is set to come out in 2019, and the description for this one says that it's a tile lane game that's driven by card play. Uh, it's set in Portugal in the 18th century. Um, you are, it looks like you're building things out in front of you uh, with tiles, and then you're going to gain bonus um, as you build certain things, deck to other things. Um, the game ends when you get to a certain number of victory points, so it's a bit of a race game. There's not much else about it on Board Game Geek, so I'm looking forward to seeing more about that one. That, that could be cool. Uh, I like the sound of a lot of those things. Uh, now we have Race for the Chinese Zodiac. This one is listed as a 2019 release. And uh, so this one is uh, listed as the publisher's starting player, but I actually just read a thing that said that uh, Capstone Games is um, going to be working with them to try and release this one uh, next year as well. I believe the designers, let's see, the designers are listed as Christina um, uh, Zen Wei and Yao Kang Leong. I am so sorry about those uh, pronunciations. Those are awful. I really do apologize. That feels like I did a very bad job there. But either way, they designed uh, Three Kingdoms Redux, which Capstone uh, Games also did. Um, now, the reason that this one stuck out to me is because the theming of it sounds really fun. Uh, it has to do with the making of the Chinese Zodiac. There are 12 animals, I guess, in the Zodiac. And um, according to the description on here, there was a competition as they raced these animals to see who got to the end of the race first. And then they named the Zodiac years after those animals in the order in which they came across. Um, that's just kind of a fun theme to kind of go off of for a game. The mechanisms are auction, hand management, simultaneous action selection, and variable player powers. So that's a bit broad, and I don't know much more about it from a mechanical perspective, but I'm intrigued. They have a bunch of photos of the prototype on uh, Board Game Geek, so you could definitely check those out. We can now move on to Roll for Adventure. This one's uh, set to come out in 2018. Uh, it's published by Cosmos, and the designers are Matthew uh, Dunstan and Brett Gilbert. Uh, now, they've both uh, designed many things in the past. Uh, Brett Gilbert in particular, um, I think he did uh, Elysium. I think maybe they both did Elysium, actually. Let me take a look at the internet real quick. And yes, they, they did both design Elysium. And I was actually pretty disappointed in Elysium, but um, I, there were a lot of really good ideas there, so it's enough to pique my interest. Uh, this one looks like it's a 30-minute uh, dice-rolling, fully cooperative game of uh, dungeon delving, and there's really not much else on Board Game Geek about it. So I am subscribed to that one to see uh, what else pops up about that one in the future. Okay, now we have Rurik Dawn of Kiev. Uh, this one's set to come out in 2019. Uh, this one's actually on Kickstarter right now. That's how I learned about this one. It's being published by Peacekeeper Games. Um, I actually talked about one of their games in the last Depressions vlog. They did Gearworks, uh, which was a pretty cool game. Uh, what's going on in Rurik is you are, uh, I guess, building the city of Kiev like a thousand years ago. And it looks like it has a lot of things going on in the map where you have like a bit of area control as you're uh, moving your uh, your control tokens around in different ways. But you're also, I think, doing several other things like um, doing some farming and building things out and uh, becoming more powerful as an area. Like I don't think it's just an area majority uh, game. It says there is uh, variable player powers and auction slash bidding. But from what I understand, they call it um, auction worker placement, I think. And I don't fully understand how it works, but it looks like the action selection style is you auction off, you put your tokens down on the different spots and where you go is how much you're going to pay. You can kind of outbid people and then they can do those actions based off of it. Um, I don't know much more of the specifics of it, but I'm definitely intrigued uh, by that one. Uh, we can now move on to Skylands. So this one uh, is set to come out in 2018 by Queen Games. And this is a re-implementation of a game called The King of Frontier. Uh, now this one was designed by somebody named Shun. Uh, that's all it says on Board Game Geek. And they also made a game called I believe Little Builders, uh, 
Little Town Builders, that's right, uh, which looked like it was a game of tile laying and then I think maybe a little bit of worker placement as you kind of comboed things together. And I've been intrigued by that one for a while. And uh, the fact that this is a re-implementation re of another game that I believe was designed by the same person uh, just has me a little bit intrigued. Yes, yeah, it's designed by the same person. And um, so what's going on here uh, is it looks like you are also laying down tiles um, in this area as you're trying to harvest things, you're building, you're collecting energy, you're getting points for a variety of different things. There's not a whole lot of um, explanation on how this works. There are zero images except for the box cover on Board Game Geek right now, but it's enough to have me intrigued. I've enjoyed lots of things that Queen has done in the past. Okay, let's now go next up to Selenia or Sun and Moon. I'm not really sure what the actual name of this one is, but technically it says Selenia on Board Game Geek. Uh, this one is being published by Pearl Games, and the designer is Sebastian Dujardin. Now, that combo of designer and publisher uh, put out a game called Deus. That came out like five or so years ago, and it was a really neat concept of a game as you uh, built little engines in front of yourself as you were kind of uh, taking over areas on a map and you had a little bit of hand management and combo building, and I really wanted to like it, but ultimately it kind of fell flat for me. But either way, it had some really great ideas, and so that's definitely enough for me to be intrigued in this one. And looking through the details of this one, what's going on here is you have this planet where the sun and moon have lost their day and night cycle, and the northern hemisphere is always in the darkness, and the southern hemisphere is always in the sunlight. And what's happening is you are constantly flying, I guess, across the planet, going from the darkness to the light, into the dark into the light. And the way that works is you have these tiles in the middle of the table that are dark, 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 and then light, 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 and then you on the, every single turn, you take this tile and you flip it over and put it up into the front. So you kind of go through a phase of light and then dark and then light and dark the way it works. And you are, I think, picking things up and dropping things off. Uh, either way, the biggest reason I'm interested in this one is that kind of conveyor belt style of the world racing below you as things are happening around you. It's fully competitive, even though it looks like the, there's just one vehicle that you're working with and the mechanisms say that it's a modular board and pick up and deliver. Uh, so yeah, I, I just, I'm just intrigued. Like it sounds like it's got some neat ideas that I haven't necessarily seen before. So I'd love to learn more about that one. So next up, it looks like we now have Tidal Blades Heroes of the Reef. Uh, this one stuck out to me for a couple reasons. The first is that they have a couple images online already and they just look like it has some gorgeous artwork going on here. Uh, and the second thing is it says that it's a dice rolling worker placement style game uh, where you are building up a dice pool and then um, you are doing things with those. Like uh, I think the theming of this world is uh, kind of a water world type of thing going on where there is definitely some land but there's tons of water and um, what you're trying to do is I believe, yeah, you're training to become a tidal blade and you there are magicians you're trying to seek help from and you're trying to impress people um, within this uh, given uh, frame of the game. And from what I understand, there's actually another game that's going to be coming out. Uh, that one is, I believe, called, yeah, Tidal Blades, The Rise of the Unfolders. And I believe that one actually um, proceeds with the story. Like there's like a cohesive story, I think, between these games, even though there's nothing mechanically, I think, similar between them. But either way, uh, I'm intrigued to learning more about this one. It's being published by Druid City Games, and they've definitely made some really good looking games in the past. All right, we've now moved on to the final game on this list, and that one is going to be Twa 2. Uh, now, this one is the two-player only version of a game called Twa, which came out many years ago which is a game that I've actually never had the, a chance to play. Uh, I've heard really good things about it, but I would love to try this one at some point. It's also actually designed by Sebastian Dujardin that I talked about before, and also uh, Xavier Georges and Elaine Orban. I apologize again for the awful uh, pronunciations of those names. Uh, this one is also said to be published by Pearl Games, and I believe it is... I think it's a roll and write style game. They only have one image online. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The image they have on Board Game Geek shows that you are crossing things off and whatnot. So obviously this is a two player only experience for a game that I've never actually played, but I've heard really good things about. And I've enjoyed roll and writes in the past. Um, so when you look at the overall mechanisms, it also says worker placement on there. Um, <laughs> at the moment, the only information actually besides that image is it says, Twa 2 is meant to provide all the sensations of Twa base game in a 20 to 30 minutes for only two people. And that's everything that's listed online so far. But this is coming out in 2019, so obviously they're going to be putting some more stuff out about this in the future. So yeah, that's going to wrap up all of the new game subscriptions that I put in over this last month. Um, I, there's obviously tons of stuff coming out more and more as we go forward. Uh, Gen Con is happening very soon. And uh, yeah, I hope that uh, maybe you found some of these interested, uh, interesting and that you go ahead and subscribe to some of these as well. And uh, hopefully we'll find some pretty good games in there. 
So with that, we've now reached the end of this vlog. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it overall. I definitely talked a lot about <laughs> Board Game Geek in that questions and answers section. Uh, and once again, quite a bit with these subscriptions. Uh, please let me know uh, any feedback that you have about this because obviously I am evolving this variety vlog style uh, going forward. Uh, I decided to switch things around a little bit and do the shifting shelf before I did those uh, sub new subscriptions uh, because I felt like more people would probably be interested in the shifting shelf. And if they're not interested in hearing about my subscriptions, they can just click the X button and uh, stop watching the video at that point. So either way, I tried to uh, change things around to make things more user-friendly for everybody. And uh, in general, I hope you enjoy it. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support these videos, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please consider clicking the like button down below as well as the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.